when Kibaki was uh, sworn in in the, in the early hours of the night, there was spontaneous uh, violence. Now they said in Swahili, Kama hiya tushindi, hii hakuta kalika, Kenya hita kalika. I had some people saying that, and I thought it was a joke. Tonight, the first of our two-part series. It is now the time for healing and reconciliation. Oh, it's my own brother, my blood brother, Dengia. From our experienced political team, a special documentary. Addressing the divide. This is an epic story of how we got here. A decade of division defined by two seasoned politicians, Mwaki Baki and Raila Odinga. Ilikuwa tu kwamba sisi tuliamini lazima tupate jia ya kuunganisha wana Kenya ili tufaulu na tutimize yale tulitaka kutimiza 1992 na 1997 na hatukuweza kuyatimiza kwa sababu tulikuwa tumegawanyika. Mikey Bak arrived at State House with a promise of economic revival, a new constitution, and unity of purpose. But his time at the House on the Hill will usher in an age of unprecedented tribalism, mistrust, and political competition anchored on anger. It was a turning point in Kenya's political division. Kibaki's rise to the apex of the country's leadership came at a time Kenya was crying for change. At the end of Daniel Arap Moy's presidency, the nation was reeling. Mimi, Mwai Kibaki, na hapa kwamba... Najib Balala, defected from Kanu, together with Raila Odinga, George Saitoti, Kalonzo Msioka, and many others. And there was a fight between Saitoti and Raila Odinga. Yes. And it was so bad until Raila Odinga gave up and said, it's not about being a prime minister, it's about getting Moy out. And because that was the rallying call, Everybody submitted to Raila Odinga being the nominee of LDP to be the Prime Minister. In 2002, as Kibaki ran for presidency, he delivered a simple message, hope and change. The National Rainbow Coalition were not the only ones looking for change. Karibu baba. Hapa kwako. Karibu Garisa baba. For Kanu and Moi, Uhuru Kenyatta, 
ignited a new political force. The president did read very well that Kenyans needed change. And, and I don't think they are going to settle for anything less than change. We want to do the business of our country in a different way. We want new players. We want people who can do things in, in, in a different way, in a better way. For Daniel Arapmoy, Uhuru represented a shift. But in some quarters, he was made into a joke, the Moy project. It led to a mass walkout as Raila Odinga engineered the disintegration of the one's indomitable party, Kano. Mwai kibaki na hapa kwamba nitatenda kazi zangu za urai wa Jamhuri ya Kenya. Mwai kibaki had promised change and more so unity. Much of the country seemed to believe he could deliver it. We are all carrying scars of bad leadership that Moi has inflicted on Kenyans. One would have preferred to overlook some of the all too obvious human errors and forge ahead, but it would be unfair to Kenyans not to raise questions. When he's leaving, you have some moments of anxiety, you know, personal anxiety. Uh, what will it be? In fact, that very evening in the capital city, members of Kano gathered. It was who is who in the now former ruling party. What kind of regime is coming in? Um, is this going to be a situation where there's victimization? Or is this going to be a situation where the rule of law uh, will be followed? They wondered out loud whether they were in the prominent minority. So clearly, there were these kind of um, anxieties, even for him. Uh, there were anxieties, I'm sure, that uh, how, he, how is he going to be treated by the new regime? Uh, are they going to, to, to settle scores? Theirs was to block the new president, explore his agenda, exploiting the divide. The economy that Mwai Kibaki inherited would be the defining challenge of his presidency, even though a push for a new constitution reshaped Kenyan politics for the next decade. Before he could deliver his promise of unity, Kibaki had to confront the increased agitation for change. People wanted a new constitution, but by this time, cracks had emerged in the ruling coalition, NAC. Now, the mistake we did as politicians and leaders for this country is the politics of deceit. We cheat each other. Power got into the heads of some people and uh, they started behaving funny, you know, uh, uh, excluding others in decision making, not uh, meeting uh, the agreements that uh, we, had, uh, we had agreed on. Backstabbing. These are the things that is haunting the country. And you remember it's the time now we were bringing in Kibaki as very young tax, Moses Kuria, um, we had uh, Kamaumbugwa. We had a team, we used to call ourselves uh, Young Democrats because of DP. Beatrice Elachi, who was then an activist with Kibaki's Democratic Party side of the NAC coalition, agrees with Balala. She says the death of Vice President Michael Kijana Omalwa, barely eight months after the NAC government was formed, deepened the cracks. It was the first blow Kibaki's unity caravan received. 
was sort of the one who would now manage to bring in and understand what uh, the team of uh, Raila would want, and he, he would moderate a go-between. But now when he became again sick, then you find again things just went not the right way for Kibaki because the person who understood both sides' politics was now not there to be the go-between, to be the peacemaker of both sides. And that is why that Kibaki government now came and that by the time we were hitting to 2004 and five, things were not the same again. Anger and distrust towards the government will grow Kibaki's closest political advisors had sown the seeds of destruction. While the president was ailing in the first few months, and it is widely believed during his first year in power. You wonder why the citizens have just turned around? It's because of the few very powerful uh, men who are within the circle of the president, when they now turn around and take advantage of their offices and use it to either get what they want, but at the same time, anyone who is uh, sort of against something they are doing becomes an enemy. Five days after being sworn in, Kibaki announced his first cabinet. It represented a major betrayal of his coalition partners. The new government acquired new power bearers, a team drawn entirely from Mount Kenya region. After Kibaki was sworn in, the gates were closed. And the gates were closed by one person called Matere Kereri, the controller of State House. These are the new operators. At least one provision had been changed. It was the provision of sharing government positions, sharing the management of state, uh, whereby the president was Mwai Kibaki. Then below there was share equally this position, ministerial positions, permanent secretary, all that stuff. Now, it was then changed to say it may not necessarily be that way. That is now what broke the government's heart back. The now coalition headed by Mwai Kibaki promised a new constitution, commissions to address large-scale corruption and arbitrary land grabbing by the elite as well as measures to tackle landlessness, unemployment and police reform. I am fully aware of the job that is ahead of us. But I am encouraged by one thing. When I've looked around and talked to people with whom we have finally agreed on how to proceed, I am convinced that we have a team which is going to be very, very strong, very powerful. But one by one, those promises were abandoned by the Kibaki regime as the NAR coalition fell apart while impunity and corruption became further entrenched. Men so close to the president had inherited a monstrous security procurement scandal known as the Anglo leasing saga, a scandal that had been marinated for six years under the Moi regime. Anglo leasing spoiled the mood of Kenyans who now favored the Odinga faction in the NAR coalition and foreign governments such as the UK, which was most vocal, and the US, which would have cut links but was more worried about its security interests. The significance of Anglo leasing in defining the narrative of the Kibaki presidency lingered for years. It was uh, with a lot of anger and uh, all of a sudden the country now turns around. Uh, corruption was being fought, yes, but still corruption was within governments. And so you have to reach a point and sort of think, how do I stop this? How do we turn down so that things settle? But it was too late. 
Kibaki failed to deliver a new constitution as he had promised. A disjointed government meant a divided nation. This will be yes. It will be like this. Yes. City of Canada. This will be. And when the 2005 constitution referendum was called for, the Raila Odinga faction joined the opposition Kano to hit back at Kibaki and his team. Sasa matashika gabu, see you! Na sisi tuko tiyari kama wanachunga kwenda nao mpaka kule katika debe. We were chungwa. Those are the guys who were banana. And we went across the country, describing how rotten a banana is. And that it is better an orange, because it is probably secured inside the pills. <laughs> And we succeeded. And Kenya has listened. Kenya has listened. Uh, I was almost the bishop of the Katiba. Kibaki was handed an embarrassing defeat in what was seen as an opinion poll over his then three year reign. Team here, orange machine, team here, Liz, is in you? Yeah. Baobumi Kwabila. The, the, the country was then split in two. The unfortunate thing is that after we won, and uh, we didn't win the government. The government was Mwai Kibaki. He sacked all of us. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't sacked. I'm saying we sacked the the the, the, the minister. Raila <laughs> Odinga, Balala. Everybody was sacked and replaced by Mwai Kibaki. Following the results of the referendum, it has become necessary for me, as the president of the republic, to reorganize my government, to make it more cohesive. He realized even if you retain them, you'll still face more challenges within. Uh, removing them gave them an opportunity to focus on uh, now Orange Democratic, that's where it was born, and, uh, and, and, and they were able now to move as an opposition. That was an indication of where Kenya was going. Adan Duale was a member of the movement that soon transformed into a political outfit, the Orange Democratic Movement, ODM, under the leadership of Raila Odinga. And the momentum of the referendum continued beyond the referendum. That's why in 2007, ODM was formed, yeah, and ODM won the election. That was a time he assembled critical leadership across Kenya. He had serious leaders from Western, he had serious leaders from, from Nyanza, Rift Valley, the whole of the pastoralist, coast, name it Nairobi. He had the, the best chance then. All of us were in ODM, I was in ODM. He had nearly the whole country. Mwai Kibaki's election in 2002 offered hope of tribal harmony, but in his first three years, it was clear the tribe was a central part of the divide and his presidency was a flashpoint. The opposition and the media reminded people just how Kibaki had centered his administration around people from his native community. They called them the Mount Kenya Mafia. They disowned the promise after we delivered them. It's like uh, you, you put a ladder for a monkey to go and climb and get the bananas. The minute he gets the bananas, he throws the ladder down. Yeah. So that was actually the downfall of the NAC government. That is where now the crisis started. So Raila had to swallow it because he had no choice. We tolerated it. It was infighting within government. The opposition of Kanu was not felt because there was opposition within. Kibaki faced an emerging reality. His chances of being re-elected were becoming feeble each day. There is no way he was going to have an overwhelming support as he did in 2002.
the man who had led his victorious campaign, Raila Odinga, was now his main challenger. With more than half the political blocs that constituted NAC gone, Kibaki was reduced to a limping minority president. Opinion polls placed the then Langata MP as the front runner. Every election, if you look from 2002, every election in Kenya has two horses. Of course, there are many donk donkeys. The anger directed at Kibaki was growing. His re-election looked unlikely, but he would fight back, rallying his supporters, including some parties that had formed the NAC coalition. But to make up for numbers in parliament and to hold on to his seat until elections are held, the Odaya MP reached out to the party he defeated in 2002 and a party he once served as vice chairman, Kanu. Personal friends like Simon Nyachai came in handy. The Ford People leader accepted a cabinet slot. For much of 2007, Kibaki cut a lonely image of a candidate on his own, headed for a downfall. Three months to the election, he had not even chosen a party by which to seek re-election. Then came a surprise launch of a party which only a few of his men knew the name. Party of National Unity, PNU. In a sharp contrast, his competitor Raila Odinga appeared to be running away with the campaign mojo, and Kibaki knew where his salvation would come from. Kano. Karibu. Karibu life. A party he once served as vice chairman and whose leader was his tribesman. For that to happen, Uhuru will shelve his presidential ambition to support a man seen as one of his own. Uhuru Kenyatta had injected hope in what appeared a lost re-election campaign. Ni kukumbushe ya kwamba hata wewe ulikuwa life member wetu wa chama hii yetu ya Khan. With Uhuru out of the race, Kibaki was now able to marshal the vote rich Mount Kenya region and cutting down a huge margin Odinga appeared to enjoy in the run up to the election. Na mimi siku fikiria Kanu watakuja tufanye kazi pamoja na ninawaomba safadhali na waomba kura yenu tafadhali thank you sana asante asante sana hello how are you kolia i realized that kenya was divided ethnicity was actually taking its toll joseph madenge an experienced photojournalist was in the thick of things as the country prepared for the 2007 elections. He covered both PNU and ODM rallies. I could see people who were affiliated to, to PNU. Most of them were either from the from a, a Central and the ODM, of course, were from Nyanza and Riftivari. You could see the division between the two groups. And the divide was growing fueled by politicians. There were signs that while we are going to this election, it's not just going to be an election. It is going to be an election where people are going to settle scores, but we don't know the magnitude of it. You'd feel the tension. And even women will whisper and tell you. And you know, at that time, women loved Kibaki so much. But they will tell you, here, it's not going to be well. The campaign of the Orange Democratic Party, which I was a member, one year to the election, was a campaign that was laced with hate speech, that was laced with ethnic tension, that created the 43 again, 42 against one. Kenya was heading into the general election on the backdrop of the country's most polarized campaign period. 
I remember some people saying that uh, if now they said in Swahili, kama hii atushindi, hii hakuta kalika, Kenya hita kalika. I had some people saying that, and I thought it was a joke, until the time of the election. During the election you could tell, for sure they meant what they said. Some will say it was not planned. In some areas, it was very well planned. And especially when you will go for a rally, and you find young people very agitated that you can't even do that rally. If indeed it was not planned, why would the young people, even before the elections, deny you to do a rally in their region? Yes. Once upon a time, Samoei and Magara landed in Kisi. But to their utter dismay, they were not as welcome as last week. Omogambi remembers. <laughs> I remember going to Nandi also, it was very volatile, before the elections. So you could see already there was something happening quietly and very well planned. December 10th, 2007 it was. The voting process and the initial stages of tallying appeared peaceful. Only isolated violent incidents and allegations of vote fixing by both the main opposition party ODM and PNU were reported. By the 29th of December, results published by the Kenyan media placed Odinga in a commanding lead. But Kibaki will gain in his heartland results, and by 30th of December, he had eclipsed Odinga. It was quite clear that there was interference by the state. And they went away with it. So we can't announce nothing. Our team that is Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. And therefore the figures that were announced here were just numbers. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Senator James Orengo was at the KCC when chaos dominated the tallying of presidential results. How did people come back? You go, you go, and I know what has happened in the last uh, election. Uh, most of the voting went on quite well in a lot of the polling stations across the nation. But when it came to the transmission of the results, that's where the problems, uh, you know, started. And some of them were done uh, at the local level between polling stations and, uh, you know, uh, constituency centers or uh, other regional centers uh, or as they were being transmit transmitted to Kenya, Kenya International Conference Center. When Kivitu gave his results, those results did not tally with the ones in the media. Raila collected me at Pentagon House and Aniambia Twende Uko. Our, our people are fighting alone at, uh, at KICC. Let us go and pack them up. <laughs> This chaos emphasized on creating more division. Form 16, which shows <laughs> from Chepalongo constituency, where the Honorable Raila Odinga garnered 42,300 votes. The tally form indicated that he had garnered 420,000 votes. With Kibaki now ahead of Raila Odinga, according to the Electoral Commission of Kenya results, ODM were convinced the results had been tampered with. We were so excited that uh, at the time all these uh, things were being done to us, we were very busy crafting the next government. <laughs> 
You are doubting your officers delaying the results. And we are doubting the same results that are being announced here. Well, in that case, uh, in that case, in that case, if you doubt us, you know where to. Let there be a retally of all the 210 constituents. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman when the, you are announcing for the first part of this press briefing, when where ODM had won, we did not hear anybody complaining. Where President Kebabe has won, the people are able. This election will be won by the ballot, not by mere shouting. Mr. Chairman, we are submitting. Proceed and announce the winner of the election and let us be able to move on. Who are you? I was telling, um, whispering to Chuck Tuma. You are a fine man. Give us fine results. Even if the fine results are us losing, so long as they are fine. I told him. Then all of a sudden, two columns of GSU started coming from my right and then doing a, a funnel. And then the electoral body officials, uh, members, commissioners, were beckoned to stand up and then they were told to walk. Then they walked through the two lines, one line on this side, another line on this side, they walked through. And they were escorted as such up to the upper room. After that was done, we were told to vacate KICC. And they were ready to beat us up. So we forget it. We have had so many conspiracies and plans of how to finish, to finish our leaders. So in our understanding, we were more concerned and worried about our presidential candidate. That's the time GSU walked in and switched off the lights and everybody was thrown out of the, of the hall. That, now that was the announcement that made me believe that things were now getting out of hand. We didn't take long. At Pentagon, I was watching those screens we had fixed up there. The announcement came. Okay, we to announce that the winner is Mike Baki. The entire Pentagon house was into, into mourning. They simply broke down. Some of them even collapsed. I mean, I remember I had to be involved in first aid on some of them. Because that was the last thing to expect. That was the last thing to expect. Because that election was won by the Orange State. How was Raila the He simply stood up, walked into his car, went away. The one who, I mean, a large number, I don't want to mention the guys who broke, but they broke down. Yeah. William Ruto, again, also walked away. Henry Koske walked away. While the results were coming in, yes, at one point, by the way, Kibaki had 400,000 more than Tinga. You know? I know many people will dispute it, but that is the truth at that time. Yeah, you know, whether it was rigged, well, but he had more. And therefore you have to announce him. As the president, there was no, they, 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 they were, that, that one would not have run away. It was like saying again, don't announce any. So then? The difference was about 200,000 votes when really proper telling was done. But you can win. That time, we were under the old constitution. The 50 plus one margin was not there. So, and, and, and I'm a Muslim, I don't want to lie. Raila Odinga won that election of 2007. Middle figures and then Kibaki. Nitai Hifadi, Nitai Linda. Controversially took oath of office to serve a second term. Mujibu wa shiria iliowekwa. Hewe mwenyezi mungu unisaidie. The private ceremony at State House was attended to 
by a heavy stench of impropriety. A small team of power handlers followed an elaborate script. At the end of it was Chief Justice Dr. Evans Gisheru, who had already been summoned at State House to conduct the nightfall rituals. It was a moment that literally set parts of the country on fire. A highly polarized campaign had preceded the bitterly contested presidential elections. The moment, no, the moment the killer of brothers and sisters, like right now, it's my own brother, my blood brother, dying here with a live bullet and out that bullet. The regions that did not support Kibaki's re election bid felt cheated by the official results and erupted in violence. Uh, PNU, uh, uh, through the action of IEBC and government then and the security agents, played a role in, the, in, in creating an environment for post-election violence. ODM, prior to the election, prepared their supporters, created ethnic tension, created uh, 40, uh, 42 against one. It was simply instantaneous. It was a reaction from the heart. People didn't expect that. No, people didn't expect that. So for anybody to come later on and start insinuating, that it was planned is simply falsehood and is simply not correct. Because if it was planned, I was in this uh, system of, uh, of, uh, of orange. How would I have had? I had no idea, no knowledge whatsoever. And I'm prepared to put up the newest of the Bibles that I had no knowledge. But it just came off. When you go out and you continue uh, putting emotional politics into your supporters, this is how they fire up. Kibaki's message of unity after his controversial oath of office was literally a case of too little, too late. I call upon all candidates and Kenyans in general to accept the verdict of the people. With the general election now behind us, it is now ti the time for healing and reconciliation among all Kenyans. Over 1,300 people were killed and over 600,000 others were displaced following the violence. So meddled were the figures that a commission of inquiry led by former South African judge Johan Krigler failed to find a green light on who between Kibaki and Odinga deserved to be in State House. You, sir, both of you gentlemen, were wise to come to the conclusion to appoint Eirik instead of trying to do a recount. That would be impossible. To put it bluntly, nobody will ever be able to say who won or who lost this election. It was simply too bad before any results got to the KICC. And after protracted boardroom talks, Kenya ended up having a negotiated government, and so they called it the Grand Coalition Government. Mike Kibaki and his rival and former ally Relo Dinga ended up sharing government. Kibaki remained president while Odinga took up the newly created prime minister's position.
there was also the recognition of Raila Odinga being the potential prime minister even before changing the law. Remember when uh, riders were sent to Pentagon House and the riders were given to Raila Odinga uh, and they escorted Raila Odinga to, uh, to Harambe House. Unfortunately, I, or fortunately, I was in that car. I was with Raila Odinga in the car. And we came out to stay to Harambe House. Unfortunately, we didn't have a formal appointment with President Kibaki. When we reached there, Kibaki refused to see us. I told Raila Odinga, maybe we don't deserve to be given the riders before the deal. But Raila Odinga felt he was entitled to those riders. I started becoming disappointed because it was not about riders that we fight to be in leadership. It was about the people of Kenya. From that time, we knew we had a raw deal. If it was focused on power, then there would have been no deal because the position that we took at the beginning was that we had won the elections and Raila should be declared uh, the uh, president of the Republic of Kenya. And uh, the worst scenario for us was a, a repeat election. Uh, uh, worst because we only had two scenarios, Raila's announced and uh, our second option was that we should go back for, for elections. It was necessary to go into that deal uh, because the entire you know, clout of the international community, either as expressed through the African Union, the United Nations, and uh, the United States of America, European Union, all of them, all of them uh, wanted Raila you know, to accept a deal. It was an arrangement that forced consultation in almost every subject of governance. But from the onset, Kibaki ensured the coalition was about sharing responsibility and minimally power. We could have done better, and we knew uh, we could have done better. But slowly, you know, a lot of people were beginning to say oh, we were now being a little bit unreasonable. Uh, and uh, we had now, you know, to, 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 to accept uh, something which could work uh, for the players and also for the country. He shared responsibilities, not power. And if you ask me seriously, I would say yes, that's correct. How from your understanding? My understanding is there's got to be a leader in any organization whom everybody would fall back to. You just cannot create a vacuum there in the name of, of collaboration. No. And again, too, you cannot share that power. It's not possible to share power. Ata nyumba ni kwako. We ndiyo mdos, bibi ndiyo chini na watoto. You cannot say, unahansa sasa kutoka leo, mnakawa, mnakawa authority ya hiyo familia, kati yako na bibi yako. Iko conflict ya tautokea maramoja hapo. One must be submissive. So, to me, that was correct. And sharing this responsibility was correct. And let me confirm here, the so-called Nusumkati, it worked. Key ministries such as internal security, defense, finance, and foreign affairs were firmly retained on Kibaki's page. Odinga ended up with what was seen as service ministries. Waziri Mkuu hana habari at the rais case atakwenda kupena district pale anapeana tu peke yake Waziri Mkuu anakuja kwa sheria kubwa kama na hii ya serikali PC hakuna Unaambia ni PC ameenda Nairobi Kama Kibaki alikuwa anakuja hapa PC angeweza kwanza kuja kwa hapa na angewekewa sana namna hii bila hata cho Angewekewa Alafu na nusu carpet namna hii if Kibaki and PNU behaved properly and accepted the terms and the position of the Prime Minister as set out in the law and in the Constitution, uh, things would have gone a different direction. K Kenya would never had a situation where an election still becomes a problem. The result of an election uh, becomes a problem.
but the Grand Coalition government's biggest headache will arrive on the 15th of October 2010, just two months after the promulgation of Kenya's 2010 constitution. The International Criminal Court indicted six Kenyans over crimes against humanity charges committed during the 2007 and 2008 post-election violence. Mr. Kenyatta, would you kindly stand up and introduce yourself? Among the six were key figures in the coalition government. They included Uhuru Kenyatta, a key ally of President Mwai Kibaki and Deputy Prime Minister Francis Mdaura, the country's head of public service, and William Ruto, Odinga's ally in the 2007 elections. This is the Kenyan historian.